You know, you have only got one life. So I guess the question is, why be miserable? You know, if you had 12 or 20 lives to experiment with, then there may be a case, probably not, but there may be a case to say, well, you know, we could waste one or two. We've still got plenty more. But you've only got one life. Why be miserable? Why be in bondage in your mind, tortured by fear, sickness, unfulfillment, dissatisfaction? Or as the Bible puts it, why do you labor for that which satisfieth not? Understanding John chapter 3 and verse 16. All right, you can come back to me immediately. Understanding John 3, 16. You know, everybody's got their favorite Bible verse, but this verse has been called everybody's favorite verse. The Bible, the gospel in a nutshell. Here it is. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What I want to do is to ask you to put your thinking cap on, have the VCR rolling, have your notepad at the ready. Don't answer that phone, but just listen carefully and learn some things that perhaps you have missed in the reading of John 3.16. I'm going to read it again, but this time I'm including verses 14 and 15 just to put it more in context. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. But whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life or eternal life. And then verse 16 again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Let's look at it bit by bit, but I have to warn you, as we get further and further into it, it'll be like going into deeper and deeper waters until maybe your eye will be open, your eyes will be open to see things that perhaps you have never seen before. First of all, it says, for God. The word in the Greek is theos, and it answers almost always to the Elohim of the Old Testament. And Elohim in the Old Testament is that big, mighty God that practically nobody could get to know. See, see God's got different names. There was Elohim, and then through Yahweh that we call Jehovah, he started to reveal himself. Then the Jehovah of the Old Testament really is Jesus revealed in the New Testament. And El Shaddai, literally the big-breasted one, with plenty of sustenance to meet the needs of his people. God's got many wonderful names. This particular one is Theos, answering to Elohim, the big, powerful God in the sky, like the God of creation. It's important to point that out, because it's that God who so loved the world. You see, God has had a bad rap. I heard of a little girl one time, she said she sure loved Jesus, but she was dead scared of God. Another little girl was talking to her friend, and they were discussing how that in the New Testament it seems that God is very friendly, and through Jesus he heals the people, but in the Old Testament, according to them, he, he was killing everybody. Not really true, but that's what they said. And one told the other, she said, well, I have the answer to that. She said, that God that you read about in the Old Testament, she said, that's before he became a Christian. Well, I want you to know it's that God, the big, powerful God, Elohim, who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. God is a God of love. It is God, Theos, Elohim. Theos, God is in the English, Theos from the Greek, Elohim coming, of course, from the Hebrew. We're talking about the God. So loved, agapao, agape, 
Agape, some say. This kind of love is the highest kind of love there is, where the desire of the donor doesn't come into it for himself, but only the welfare of the recipient. When it says God so loved Agapao, it's that kind of love which says, I am going to do this for the happiness of the recipient. Now, there's other kinds of love. There's phileo, from which, by the way, the city of Philadelphia gets its name, city of brotherly love. But this love here in the Greek, one more time, is the highest kind of love. It's love without ulterior motive. It is love that is non-judgmental. It is the benefactor saying, I'm doing this for the exclusive benefit of the recipient. Do you know that this big God in the sky so loved you with the highest form of love that He went out of His way to do something to make you happy? What was that something? For God so loved the world. The word there is the cosmos. In this instance, meaning everything and the people in it, of course, in this world. That He gave, what a gift. God gave. God gave. It is a 100% gift so that you cannot earn salvation in any way. You get saved by pinning your hopes and your trust in Christ and what He did on Calvary's tree. That He gave His only begotten Son. The word in the Greek is His only unique Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. That whosoever believeth in Him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Let's look at it again. For God, Elohim, Theos, so loved Agapao, the highest form of love, that He did something about it. He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever, now here's where we've got to go deeper, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish. Remember these two words, believeth, and perish. First of all, whosoever believeth. You know, it's unfortunate that with the passage of time, words lose or change their meanings. There's the etymological meaning of a word, or there's the given meaning. I mean, it used to be, for example, that cool meant something was cool going on to be cold. Nowadays, in the vernacular, if something's cool, it means it's wonderful at least according to the young people today. That's cool. That's wonderful. It, it really has taken on a new meaning. Well, the word believeth has lost so much of its power from what it really meant in Bible days. Are you a believer? Well, if somebody gets at that, uh, asked that question, they say, why, why sure. I'm a, I, I'm a Protestant. I'm a Catholic. I'm a Hindu. I'm a believer. I'm a believer in God. Do you believe there's a God? Yes. Well, that's what it seems to say here, whosoever believeth. But, oh, it's a thousand million times deeper and greater than that. Whosoever believeth. Let me just explain something here. You read your Bible here. Obviously, it's in English. But let's go back a little bit, for example, into the Old Testament. Way back there in Bible days, it was written in Hebrew. But the day came when 70 scholars meeting at Alexandria in Egypt, it got its name from Alexander the Great, these 70 scholars met in order to translate the Old Testament from Hebrew into Greek. And then a lot more people could read it and grab it and understand it. It's called the Septuagint. The Septuagint, Sept for 70, because there were 70 scholars there. That's the Bible that was in vogue in circulation when our Lord Jesus came upon this earth, because this translation, the Septuagint, happened B.C. So when Jesus came, this is the Bible that people had, the Old Testament, but also available in the Greek language. So let's look at this a little bit deeper, not just in the English but trace it back right to the Hebrew. First of all, if you go from the English to the Greek, it becomes pistaul, 
or it, it's, it's cognate with the word pistis. And what is pistis? Well, it is, it is faith, it is believing, but, but really it is trusting. It is to develop a lifestyle of trusting God. Not just a one-off thing to get saved, that's good, but to develop a lifestyle of trust so that you become an amazement to your friends and a consternation to your enemies. Because even when it seems to be in your life, that the house is burning down and the ship is sinking. You've still got a poise, a tranquility, a peace, a, a shout in your soul, a victory in your very face that defies all logic. Why? Because you have learned to trust. You see, while the church has been taking time over the years to lay heavy rules and regulations on people, I was raised in Ireland. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't smile on a Sunday. Don't breathe almost. Wear makeup. Don't wear makeup. Wear hats. Don't wear hats. So forth and so on. And over the years, the church has been laying that upon people, but that's not God's message. What God's message is this, that you begin to learn not the perfection connection, because God knows you're not perfect. We depend on His perfection, but the trust connection. This word, whosoever believeth on Him, is not merely, yes, I believe. It's whosoever trusteth, in the Greek, pistao, or pistis, which really is ABC. Action based upon belief and sustained by confidence. And so when we go to the Greek, we get it a bit better, but it's when you go back to the Hebrew from which the Greek came through the Septuagint, as I just explained, you get it better again. Do you know that in the Old Testament there are seven different Hebrew words, all of which are translated trust? And trust in the Old Testament becomes the believing or the faith in the New Testament. Seven. Yes, well, I can't give you them all, obviously. But we're tracing back this, when Jesus said, or really John is saying it in summary of what Jesus said. Whosoever believeth, whosoever peaceth, trusteth, go back to the Old Testament, whosoever develops a lifestyle of trust. Here are three of the Hebrew words, bata, hasa, and aman. Now, now, don't be put off by big Hebrew words. You don't even have to learn them all. Later on, I'll put them on the screen, and you'll see them in summary form. But let me explain what they mean so that we can grab hold of the meaning of trust as a lifestyle, trusting Him. Whatever befalls, says the song, trusting Jesus, that is all. Trust Him in the morning, trust Him at noontime, trust Him when the sun goes down. Trust Him with your life, your finances, your health, your future, your eternal abode. You trust God. You learn how to trust. You know what bata is in the Hebrew? Somebody who, it's a picture word in the Hebrew, somebody who leans upon the top of his staff because he knows it will hold his weight. Nowadays, we don't think of leaning upon the top of the staff. So if you're sitting down as I'm talking to you, as I'm sitting down, then it would be the act of sitting in the chair. You, you don't stop and think, will this chair hold my weight? You commit yourself to the chair. Why? Because it's got a record. It's got a past track record of holding people of your weight or even more. Bata to lean upon him. You remember the old song, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. In fact, there's a, there's a, a comparatively new song over this last number of years, a beautiful song, Learning to Lean. I'm learning to lean on Jesus. God's not after you with a big stick to beat you into the ground because you're not perfect. God's looking for a trust relationship in spite of your imperfections where you rely on His perfection and not your own. Bata, to put your full leaning weight upon Him, grabbing His promises, and regardless of all contradictory evidence, 
absolutely declaring that what God said will come to pass in your life. Bata. Hasa. H-A-S-A-H. That's another one translated trust in the Old Testament. Remember, these came from the Hebrew through the Septuagint into the Greek and then finally into the English. It ends up believing, but it's stronger than that. You know what hasa is? It means to run. Literally, it means to run to the rock that's over jutting so that you're hid from the storm. Or it means the little chicks running onto the wings of mother hen for protection. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Those words, by the way, were written in Ireland of all places. To run. You see, when you blow it, when things go wrong, when something happens and you feel convicted or condemned, the devil wants you to run. He wants you to run away from God. The attitude being, well, God's against me. God doesn't care. I'm going to quit. Why try to serve God? No! Hasa means the opposite. It means when you're in trouble, either brought about by yourself, somebody else, or directly from the devil, regardless of the source, when you're in trouble, run to the rock that is higher than you are and receive protection. That's what it means to trust. Bata, to lean. Hasa, to run to the rock that is higher than you are. And aman, A-M-A-N, that's where we get amen from. And it literally means absolutely, so be it, without the shadow of a doubt. There's no question about it. You can move on to the next item on the agenda because God said it and that's it. And if you go back to Numbers, in the Old Testament it tells us, God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the Son of Man that he should repent. Has God not said it? Will he not do it? Will he not bring it to pass? Will he not make it good? So what Jesus is saying here is this. As a lifestyle, for God Elohim so loved Akapao with the highest form of love, the world, that whosoever, that includes you. I know that not everybody's going to be saved. But Jesus is like the man in the New Testament. The Bible says he bought the field that he will get the treasure. Jesus paid the price for the whole world. He knows he's not going to get the whole world, but he was willing to do that in order to get the treasure, the church, those who will accept him as their personal Lord. I'm not into a message of condemnation, one that's condemnatory. But God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, unique Son, that whosoever believeth, whosoever develops a lifestyle of trust in every circumstance, not just with their eternal soul, that's the most important thing, but with the little, the medium, the large things of life, whether you've got a major piece of bad news or you've got a flat tire on the highway. Whatever it is, you got a cold, whatever. We look to Him and we learn how to trust Him on a daily basis. But the next word is rather amazing. Whosoever develops a lifestyle of trust in Him, trusting Christ, should not perish. Apolumi is the Greek word. We'll come to it after a little bit. Apolumi, apolumi shall not perish. What is the meaning of apolumi? It simply means to lose. In fact, several times in the New Testament, apolumi is translated as lose. Here it happens to be translated as perish. And that makes us think only of our soul perishing in the next life. Now that would be awful. And the most important thing is for your soul to be saved and to make sure your soul is not lost. But when it says here, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, really what Christ is saying is, the moment you start trusting in him, you stop losing. You stop being a loser. And apolumi means both things temporal and things eternal. So that when you stop being a loser, it means you start, you start being a winner in the affairs of life. Why? Because it says in response to your trust, instead of apolumi, instead of losing, 
you receive everlasting life. Life there is Zoe. It's God's quality of life. So an exchange is made. An exchange for trust. Life, God's life, comes to you. Not only to save your eternal soul, but to operate in your life and your circumstances so that that life does in your circumstances what your life couldn't do. But operating through you, God starts to control and dominate the situation to give you victory. Victory in your body regarding health. Victory in your mind regarding peace. Victory in your finances to be Jehovah Jireh and to supply all your need. This is the development of a lifestyle. Apolumi. I want you to get it. And what God is saying here, if you learn to trust me, as soon as you trust, there is an immediate exchange. And when trust goes to God, God's life comes to dominate that situation. Not just your soul to be saved, and that's the most important thing. But apolumi means to affect that which is temporal as well as that which is eternal. This is incredibly important. Now, I want to give you a couple of scriptures just to back up my point. Apolumi to perish means to destroy. It can mean physical death. It can mean spiritual death. And it can mean simply to lose. Uh, to lose... Well, almost anything. Look, for example, at Mark. Let me grab this quickly. At Mark chapter 9 and verse, I believe, 41. Let me get this. For whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name, because ye belong to Christ, verily I say unto you, he shall not, apolumi, he shall not lose his reward. The word is talking about losing something. In this instance, apolumi means you will not lose your reward. Here is another one in Luke chapter 15 and verse 4. And it says here, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, apolumi, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost, apolumi until he find it. A lost reward, a lost, in this instance, a lost sheep. Let me give you a couple more. Look, same chapter, verses 8 and 9. A lost coin. Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose, apolumi, one piece doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently until she find it. And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had, Apolumi. So whether you're talking about a lost reward, a lost sheep, a lost, in this instance, coin, or a lost soul, Matthew 10, 39, let me read this as the last one to you. Matthew chapter 10, and here it is, verse 39. Let me get it for you. Here it is. He that findeth his life shall lose it. Apolumi shall lose it. But he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Why did I take time to go into all that? To show you what the word perish means. Apolumi. It means simply to lose. In other words, there's a lifestyle here. You see, when does eternal life begin? Does it just begin when you die and eternal life then takes your soul to heaven make sure, make, making sure you avoid hell? No. Eternal life, listen to it, with all of its benefits, both for time and eternity, begins at the moment of believing. In fact, it says here in John chapter 3 that this is connected to the illustration of what happened in the Old Testament, the book of Numbers. The children of Israel, they have sinned again. The serpents start biting them. Many die, many are in the process of dying. Now, it doesn't mean that God sent the serpents. The serpents were always there. Up to that point, they had protection. God lifted the protection temporarily. They're dying. You know what God says? When Moses cried for deliverance, he said, well, take a serpent, make it of brass. Brass in the Bible always speaks of judgment. Put it on a pole. 
It represents Christ that would come, not the serpent. Don't ever think that. But the fact that when Jesus would come, he would judge and bring to an end the devil's power in your life. For this purpose, 1 John 3 and 8, was the Son of Man manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. And you see, when they put that serpent on a pole speaking, this serpent is nigh uh, dead, has lost its effective, has lost its power. See that the serpent has lost its power. Then when were they delivered? They brought their loved ones from the corner of the tents. They brought them out into the aisles. They propped open their eyes. And when it says they looked, and by the way, the Hebrew is, they looked gazingly with, with intent and with good motive, not just a casual glan glance. When they looked, they lived. There was an absolute exchange. When they looked, they lived. Well, this is the illustration here in the New Testament. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, and when they looked, they lived. Oh, there's an old song we used to sing in Ireland. There is life for a look at the crucified one. There is life at this moment for thee. Then look, sinner, look unto him and be saved. Unto him who has died on the tree. Look, look, look and live. There is life for a look at the crucified one. There is life at this moment for thee. How marvelous that is. You see, when they looked, they lived. In exchange for the look, there was the life that flowed. Now we can't explain it technically, for we do know what happened. We do absolutely know that it happened. Well, the Bible says, as that happened, so with us. Only we don't merely look with the physical eyes. What we do is we trust. When we develop a lifestyle of trust, you know what happens? Out of that flowing trust, we say, Lord, we trust you. We thank you for blessing us. We thank you for your promises. We thank you in spite of all these circumstances. You're going to bring us through in spite of all these reversals and setbacks and sicknesses and pains. You're going to deliver us or whatever the situation is. The moment you start to trust, at that moment, in exchange for trust, eternal life comes, everlasting life. Now, of course, when that deposit of everlasting life is made in your soul, then your soul will be saved for eternity. But it's more than that. For when you're trusting God on a daily basis for the daily affairs, then that life goes to work for you in your circumstances. For it says clearly, for God, Elohim, Theos, so loved Agapa, Agapao. The world, the cosmos, that he gave, it's a gift, his only begotten unique son, that whosoever, that includes you, believeth, trusteth. Bata leans on his promises. Hasa runs to him for protection. A man, a man, so be it. Whosoever trusts shall not apolumi, shall not perish, but don't get the idea it only has to do with perishing in hell. It literally means shall not lose. That is, shall not lose his soul in eternity, and in the meantime, shall not lose in the battle of life to the devil or to circumstances. Why? Because the moment you trust, you receive life, not just in your soul for your eternal salvation. You already know that part. But when you trust him in a, a given situation, then that life goes to work in order to bring you the victory. You shall not perish, you shall not lose. And what is that life that comes to you? Well, the Bible says, in him was life, and the life was the light of man. It's as if God turns on lights for you, throws lights upon uh, life's problems so that you can act intelligently, gives you an inner peace, an inner knowing that God is with you. Look at the summary of it, verse 17. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world. Did you get that? But that the world through him might be saved. To be saved, to, to save, zozo. Salvation, soterion. That Greek word is so incredible that we can hardly get English words to explain it. What is this to be saved? When we look to him, when we trust him. Well, it means we got saved. We are being saved. 
We will yet be saved. We will be saved eternally. It means prosperity in the right sense. It means uh, uh, well-being, good health, blessing, strength. It means all those things. And how do they come? They come in exchange for trust. Oh, you've got to get this. They come in exchange for trust. I want to go back one more time to the word believeth. Pistus, bata, hasa, aman. You know, whatever God comes up with, the devil has a cheap takeoff of the real McCoy, which is a poor substitute for it. You know what man has done? Man has said, oh yes, we believe in believing. And they center their faith in their own heads, their own thinking. Something like the people at the Tower of Babel who said, we can climb up here, we can make it on our own. Jesus talked about those who are seeking to climb up some other way. Let me tell you this, dear friends. I'm not talking about Tony Robbins with success teaching that is in the mind. I'm not talking about, now you may be offended by this, but listen to me. Napoleon Hill and his think and grow rich, meeting with his eight counselors who were eight demons. Demons. Oh, it doesn't mean that they don't say some good things. But would you want a dinner that's got several good things and a bunch of arsenic in it as well? It's the humanistic takeoff. The power of possibility thinking. The power of positive thinking. No, we are not into that. We're not talking about, you know, gritting your teeth and bawling your hands up into a fist and saying, I believe, I believe, I believe. We're not talking about that which is centered in your own mind. And by the way, such is the power of the mind, as demonstrated at the Tower of Babel, it will bring certain temporary results. But you know, if you go to a success seminar and they just tell you how to get more toys, and your soul still goes to hell at the end. Do you really think that you have won? I'm talking about the real McCoy, not a cheap, mental, humanistic substitute. I'm not talking about that. Jesus said, without me, ye can do nothing. So with all your great positive thinking, you're going to end up in a lost eternity unless you do it God's way. When we're talking about believing English, Pistis in the Greek, or bata, hasa, a man in the Hebrew, we're talking about leaning on the everlasting arms. We're talking about faith in God, faith in God's promises, not faith in our faith, not faith just in our words, though we speak out the word of God, but faith in the promises as written in the scriptures, faith in the fact that well, the song puts it best. My heavenly Father watches over me. Isn't that the truth? Trust. There's so much more I want to say, but I want to say this instead. Trust Him in the morning. Trust Him at noontime. Trust Him when the sun goes down. Trust Him at nighttime. Learn to develop the trust relationship. Lord, everything's in Your hands. God, you're going to take care of me today. Heads I win and tails the devil loses. Come what may. You know, the apostle Paul said he had the best of both worlds. He said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. In other words, he said to the devil and to Rome, you let me live and I'll live for Christ. You kill me and I'll get more of Christ. You lose every time and I win every time. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him, trusteth in Him, should never perish, not lose. Apolumi. Shall not lose temporarily, and shall not lose eternally. And for those who make this to emphasize that we're saved in eternity, I really have no argument. That's the most important thing that our souls are not lost. But I'm also saying it means something else. If you understand the word apolumi, you know that it clearly means in the Greek not to lose, whether you're talking about losing a reward, a sheep, a coin, a soul. It's talking about don't lose. You need to come to Christ. 
And if you've already come to Christ, don't live in a panic. Don't live going to pieces, regardless of the storm, but rather look to Christ and trust Him. You know what this Irish preacher is up to? To seek to lead you, the best I know how, into the trust relationship with God. It will change your life. All right, let's go to these uh, words on the screen. God, theos is the Greek. It answers to the Elohim, the great, big, powerful God of the Old Testament. Just go to the next one. The word loved is agapao, as I have said, which is the highest form of love there is, where the donor is only thinking of the welfare of the recipient. That's the kind of love God has for you. Go to the next one. Believeth, that's English. Pistao, pistis, that's the Greek. Trust, when you go right back into the Hebrew, seven words that are translated as trust. And I'm going to give you three of them. Let's go ahead. Trust, bata, to lean upon the staff, to lean with all your weight upon the Lord, for he will sustain you. Go to the next one. Hasa, to run to the rock. Ruth Ann was singing about it. Run to the rock that is higher than you are. He will protect you and he will bring you through. Period. Go to the next one. A man from which we get a man. So be it. Absolutely. God's word is true. Go to the next one. The word perish can also be translated, as I have proved today, the word to lose something. Apolumi. There it is in the Greek. Apolumi. Apolumi. You can come back to me. I want you, please, to develop a trust relationship and never forget these words. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth trusteth in him, shall stop losing in time and eternity. Why? Because when you trust, in exchange for the trust, God's life, which is light, goes into operation in whatever you're trusting him for to bring about a desired result. Have you got that? Isn't that rather remarkable? Understanding John 3.16 and remember, as you trust, life and light comes, and you lose no more, either in time or in eternity. You become more than a conqueror.